My name is Linda, Linda Broxick, and Emmy and I work for a company called Collins Aerospace. Um, that name in and of itself is new to us. Uh, we were formerly Rockwell Collins, if anyone has ever heard of our company, and we were acquired just less than a year ago. So we're going to tell you a story today um, about that journey that we've been on. And um, the first thing I want to say is that Rockwell Collins Heritage Legacy Company has had knowledge management um, in place and a formal program in place for just under 20 years. Um, so this was, a, this was a challenge to our program, not only a challenge to our company and all of the people, but also to the KM program. And so we're going to talk to you a little bit about how we've um, approached the KM program in these times of acquisition and, and change. So first I just want to tell you a little bit about the, um, the company that we work for, Collins Aerospace. Um, we are part of the United Technologies Corporation, if you've ever heard of UTC, if you've ever heard of Pratt & Whitney, uh, Otis Elevators, the moving sidewalks you see in the airports, things like that, right? This is a very large corporation and of which there are four divisions and we are part of Collins Aerospace. Now, the interesting thing is, don't get used to the two divisions on the bottom, Carrier and Otis, because they will no longer be part of our company um, by the end of this year. So more to come on that. Things just keep changing. So the Collins Aerospace Division that we work in is 70,000 70, people strong. Uh, prior to our uh, acquisition, we were about 30,000 people at Rockwell Collins. So still a large company, but we, we got more than twice as big as what we were used to dealing with. And also have this corporate structure now that we get to deal with as well. This is just a little bit around the numbers. What we do, basically anything that's not the actual airplane itself, the airframe, we build. We develop avionics solutions, we develop the seats in the airplane, we build the landing gears. Pratt & Whitney builds the engines, the software you use in the airport that you um, may or may not like on some days in the kiosks, um, that's part of our company as well. So basically everything that's inside of an airplane is, um, has a Collins product on it. So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the good old days, you know, before the evil acquisition happened and how um, we thought about our company before and after the acquisition. Then we're going to talk about what it feels like when you're in, from a change perspective, what we like to call the messy middle. The change itself happens, but then there's this ickiness that happens after the change itself occurs, and you have to figure out who you are in this new world. And then finally, we're going to close out with what we are starting to see as the new normal, but I'm also not sure that we're convinced that we're ever going to be normal or we're ever going to stay in a state that we can call the new normal until a change is thrust upon us again. So just a very different perspective that we have to take um, to not only our KM program, but just how we work every day and the employees and how they approach everything that, that we encounter on a regular basis. So the good old days. So I put this picture in here because it was amazing to me that over a year ago, the things that you would hear people talking about in the hallways were, were always, this process is broken. I hate this tool. How come we can't use this? This person doesn't know what they're doing. Why aren't we doing this? You always were able to focus on all the things that you maybe didn't do as well as you thought. There was always something to, um, I like to say there were opportunities, but a lot of times we might complain about the things that we do. As we went through, have gone through this acquisition process, all of a sudden, we're awesome. Why aren't we doing it the way we always did it? That was the best way to do it. I can't believe they don't want to do it the way we want to do it, right? So it was interesting to see this, um, this change actually happen. And it's, had to, it's, it's helped us to really look at the balance that, guess what? There's goodness in both of these companies. That's the reason they came together. So what we need to try to figure out is what's the awesomeness on both sides? And let's move forward together and create twice twice as good as we used to be in the past, right? But it's just interesting, we hear this all the time, we were better, we did this better, we did, and so we try to get people to start thinking about now, the we is all of us now, going forward. And it's really tough to do, and Emmy's gonna talk a little bit more about change, so you'll see that we've gone through our own change uh, management um, as well. Some days we didn't necessarily wanna walk into the company and be the advocate for everything because we didn't feel good about it either, just to be transparent, so. Now, just to give you a little bit of a glance so you understand the context of which we're coming from when we talk about our KM program, um, we've had KM formally at, at our heritage company for close to 20 years. UTC did not. 
They did in some aspects where they had some research uh, uh, organizations, or an organization that did some research for people, so if you needed some research done on information, you could call them. They had a library science background. It's a great resource. We didn't have that at our company, so now we get to talk together about that, which is awesome. But they didn't understand the concepts of communities or anything like that, so a lot of this is new to them. But to give you some context, we started um, back in the early 2000s um, with rolling out some of the more, I'll say, basic principles around knowledge management. And we started where I believe you always should start and where always the crux of your program and the biggest benefit of your program is, and that's with the people. Because technology is gonna change, the company's gonna change, the org structure is gonna change, the processes are gonna change. But the one thing that remains constant is that there's people and humans behind every aspect of what we do from a knowledge management perspective. I mean, the whole reason we do it is because we're trying to get the knowledge out of people's heads and onto paper, or we're trying to get information to people faster so they can do their jobs more efficiently, okay? So very critical to us is to always focus on that community of practice focus. And when we say communities at our company, we mean a group of people who actually get together and talk to each other on a regular basis. It's not just an online forum, it's actually a meeting that takes place on a regular cadence where folks um, contribute and transfer tacit knowledge to one another. Um, through that process, so really important. Now, through the years, we've developed additional um, uh, capabilities in our KM program, uh, online um, uh, resources, knowledge bases. We've gone through the SharePoint uh, journey. Uh, we then went to Google uh, about four or five years ago. We're gonna go away from Google now that we're part of a bigger corporation to go back to Microsoft. So again, the tools change and we adapt. These are our collaboration tools, these are what um, the company has chosen from an enterprise perspective, we adapt within our KM program to use the best um, possible solutions within those tools that we can, and try to drive um, some of the enhancements that take place within those tools. Um, about 10 years into our, uh, our journey, we actually did do a revitalization of our program, and we hired APQC to come in and help us from a maturity perspective measure where we were, and kind of revision and really look at what do we need to do for the next 10 years from our KM program. And this is something that we did, we're pretty proud of, where we established the vision of knowledge management. And our vision is accelerate knowledge, create value. And we love that because it stands the test of time. It doesn't have to change. It doesn't have to go with new technologies. We're always about accelerating knowledge and creating value for the organization. So that vision has stood for 10 years and will continue to stand as we go forward. Um, and then in that, we continue to create additional solutions. We have internal YouTube channels. We have expertise location. Um, we went from more of a search to a find mentality. And we also have really made the KM program enter more enterprise focused. Everyone in our company knows what a COP is in a community. It's a language that we all understand, okay? Um, it started and has been sponsored by the engineering organization within our company because we have a large population of engineers. They drive those solutions very well, and we always say, if it works for engineering, it'll work for anybody because they're the toughest customer, right? And so that's kind of been our mantra. Now, partway through this journey in 2013, uh, myself personally, I made the jump from engineering into the operations division because I saw a need for knowledge management and change in operations, and um, it wasn't happening as well as I think it probably could have. So I've been working in operations and quality and supply chain for the last uh, six and a half years, and we've really been trying to bring those capabilities into that organization. So. That's a little bit of the journey over the last 20 years um, and, and where we were until November 27th, 2018, when day one happened. And as Emmy always says, the popcorn and the movies and all the celebrations started and the company name changed, but we all walked into our office and said, do I still do the same thing today? Do I still talk to the same people? What tools am I supposed to use, right? It's a very confusing place. And um, it's, what I like to call, what we like to call the messy middle. And now Emmy is going to focus a little bit on the messy middle and what that journey has been like over the last 12 months and how that's impacted our KM program. And just be, um, stay tuned because it's gonna get a little philosophical and a little psychologist focused, but it is people. So if we don't focus there, we're not gonna understand uh, what we're dealing with and put the solutions in place that we need, so. Um, as Linda said, I'm going to focus on the messy middle. We felt like a couch was a pretty good uh, 
graphic for that situation. There's a little bit of therapy involved in this space. Um, I'm not a psychologist. I don't play one on TV, but I do like to I do like to read about this stuff and dabble in this space. So as a change manager, I'm looking at projects and saying, okay, you understand what to do from a technical perspective. Do you understand what your people have to do differently? Because I don't know of many changes where people don't have to do something differently, right, for them to be successful. So as Linda said, you know, when there's a, a merger that happens, I w walked in the door the next day and it was the same building. I had the same office. My reporting structure hadn't changed. But all of a sudden you're like, Few, few months go on and you're like, wait, where, where is this? This something feels different. I, I don't know where I'm at, right? There was that day one change that happened, but there's this transition that goes on. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about that at first. Change is an event. Change is when we flip the switch and turn that new software on, right? Um, if you think about it in practical terms, a wedding is an event and we plan the heck out of an event. We don't let anything go by the wayside. We think about who's gonna walk grandma down the aisle. We ask people whether they're, eat, they're eating chicken or beef. We uh, plan a playlist. We don't miss anything. But what happens, right, with a change in reality is there's something old that ends. So maybe we weren't married. Now we're married, but there's something new that begins. Now we're in this new place, right? There's the event, which is the wedding. Or let's say um, you're gonna have a baby. The baby having is an event, right? But there's some other things that go on. And that is the transition. And this is where we tend not to manage um, quite as well. We tend to manage the event. So as Linda said, we had day one and we had popcorn and we had music. Um, but then we all kind of had to go back and figure out, well, how are we gonna walk through this transition? And um, we maybe, maybe don't always plan those things as well as we should. Um, so, this can happen in your KM programs too, right? You release a new software, you stand up communities of practice, we get all excited, we get all the people in the room, we have this day one event, um, but then time goes on, have we managed the resistance that comes up? Have we managed um, and coached leaders to help their employees through that space? Um, are we continuing to reinforce those messages and deal with that transition? And that's really what we're managing when we're managing change. We're not just managing the event, which is really important to remember. So this is a pretty typical change curve. Um, if you have a background in continuous improvement, I'm sure you've seen this in, in various aspects. The change curve is pretty typical here, right? So you've got this depth down the side of productivity drain, and then you've got energy drain across the bottom. Pretty common if you're introducing anything new that people aren't gonna be up to speed immediately. Sometimes leadership thinks what happens is we go from current state to future state way up here and, and all the good things happen, but they don't usually happen without some of those productivity drain and energy drain. Uh, change management comes along to look at these things and it doesn't eliminate the dip, but it does minimize it. But I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the stories that people tell when they're in this space. And I deliberately left off number four for the moment. But we really, I don't know if, if you as um, knowledge managers and people who care about KM, as a change manager, I really care about stories. I care about what stories we're telling to people. Um, you think of Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey, you're trying to figure out how to sell company uh, stories and new changes through this really dynamic, powerful way. It's easier said than done some days. But we're also really, really prone to storytelling as human beings, and we tend to take a fairly negative approach to the stories we like to tell ourselves. So especially in a merger and acquisition, right, we, we're missing information, we have a lot of ambiguity. Our brain starts to fill in those holes, right, that lack of information with our own stories. So as you can see, I and mean, I remember walking the halls, right, and when the, the rumors were kind of starting to circulate that this might be going down, and you could hear people saying, oh, we've heard this before, yeah, this will pass, don't worry about it, just give it a couple more weeks. Or what is going on? Who is making these decisions? Why is this happening to us, right? So people are going through these curves and telling these stories in this space. Um, this is, I think, a great place for people who care about knowledge management uh, to really step up and help people get through that curve quicker. If you think about communities of practice, as Linda's mentioned in our space, the communities of people who were already established and the ones that were doing well had a built-in community to kind of process through some of this stuff. They had um, sub-disciplines that were in place and when the, the company merged on day one, they had people that they were looking for on the other side of the business, on that UTAS side, to say, hey, we think we, think we got some synergies together. Can we get together? What can we do? And um, that helps people. 
action breaks anxiety, right? When the people can get to the other side and find their people and start connecting, you've got this built-in community. I think knowledge management, even, even if it's in an online forum or whatever space, has a lot of opportunity to help people move through these transitions and these changes much quicker. And certainly was the case for us in our stronger communities, I, mm -hmm. I will say, excuse me. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving here. This is what the messy middle feels like. We've got Dave, he's on the dock, and we've got Jerry, he's in the boat. Let's say Dave works for Rockwell, and, and he, Jerry works for UTAS. Oh, he didn't make it. There's this really, really hard feeling that happens with the messy middle. Have you, ever been on, have you ever been on a dock and you've been trying to get into a boat, and you've got that moment where one leg's on a really firm foundation? And the boat, Jerry's doing fine in the boat too, right? But getting into the boat from the dock is a really disconcerting feeling. It feels really bad, right? For the sake of comedy, I, I didn't get Dave in the boat. So hopefully Dave makes it in the boat in the real life story, but you know, it's much funnier that he falls in the water. So uh, this is a model that I use to think about the storytelling that we kind of um, tend to do. Uh, it's been very helpful to me both personally and professionally. I use this as a coaching tool when people come into my office and they're bent out of shape about stuff. I also use this as a coaching tool for myself. It's a reflection tool for when I'm in a space, right? Because this helps us move through the messy middle much quicker because of our propensity to tell stories. So I, I, I'm going to quote a neuroscientist. I'm not one of them, so hopefully I get this right. But when we have missing information or we have ambiguous information, our brains, we like to fill in the stories with something. And we get a chemical reward for that. I think they call it a dopamine lollipop. This is what the gentleman referred to it as. And so we get rewarded chemically for telling these stories, for filling in these blanks when we have missing information. Unfortunately, like I said, we tend to go down a fairly negative path. But we kind of can get addicted to telling these negative stories. And you might even work with people who um, operate in this space. They go door to door telling these stories. If you won't listen, they'll go find somebody else to go listen to the story, right? As a, as a change manager, I deal with resistance management. This is, I think, a space that I see this resistance play out as we get into the storytelling mode. So I'm going to walk you through this model. And hopefully, there's something personally or professionally that can help you here in this space. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about Tim, who works in sales, and let's say Lisa, who works in procurement. So the story starts with an event. Something happens. In this case, Tim filled out a form. He sent it to Lisa. And when Lisa opened the form, there was information missing on that form. So Lisa looks at this, and she starts thinking things. She says, Tim is an idiot. He's never filling in these forms correctly. If it weren't for me holding this company together, I don't know how this place would go on. Have you ever heard people say this? I think I might have said it some days yeah. too even. <laughs> and so she goes from this thinking, right? This event happens. She starts thinking these things. And then she goes into emotion, right? She, she's stressed out. She's angry with Tim. She becomes maybe uh, self-righteous about how she's better than Tim. And then what happens? Lisa goes into action. She starts behaving in a certain way, right? So she starts, um, maybe she calls Tim or sends him an email and says, hey, if you can't get your act together, this is going to sit on the back burner, and I'm not touching this for another month because I'm sorry you went to the back of the line. Or maybe she doesn't call Tim or do anything with it, just puts it in an inbox and it sits there. So her behavior starts to change based on the stories that she's uh, made up. And then what happens? Actual real results start to be a problem, right? The company starts, uh, we don't get our customer what they need in time. Um, we, our customer service falls off. Whatever the case may be, we start incurring actual results out of that behavior. So th the storyline here is that when you're in an emotional space, it's very difficult to you, for you to rise to your higher self and really be of help to people. So the question is, is how can you be reflective in this space and how can you be reflective with others who are going through this messy middle to say, hey, what are, tell me what you're thinking right now. What, what really happened? What are the facts? Let's, let's get the ego, because our ego likes to tell us these stories, right? Because it gets that chemical reward. And so we go into that mode. How can we be self-reflective? What, what's the next thing we would do if, if we didn't believe that story as true, right? So we, we move into a place where we start helping each other, ourselves, we start moving through things and through that messy middle, right? So mergers and acquisitions are a perfect time because we're always missing information in that space. So the truth of the matter is, is that we're being stressed out, not because of what happened to us, but because the stories we told ourselves about what happened to us. 
Um, the, this, a lot of this content is from a company called Reality Based Leadership. It's based, I believe, in part on um, Byron Katie's work. But I think the idea is, is that most of the time that we're offended about things, they never even happened. So how can we be self-reflective about um, how we're thinking about things when we're in these really ambiguous and difficult spaces where we're very prone to do those things, right? So this is how this plays out a little bit with, with leadership. And this slide tends to be very powerful. Um, every time we present this, Linda's presented it more times than I can count. I've presented it many times as well. Uh, talking to leaders, senior leaders, executive leadership, um, the light really comes on, I find, with this slide. So we've got this change curve, right, that we told you about before. And I, the numbers match up. I didn't tell you about four. We'll talk about that in a minute. But what happens a lot of times is senior leadership is way out ahead on decisions that are being made. They are maybe implementing the decision. If you think about the merger and acquisition, they, they were in the know ahead of time. A lot of them were on implementation teams, had a lot more time to process various things, right? Often what happens next, maybe you're rolling out a KM program, the next group who has to know is maybe middle managers, right? So now they're in storytelling mode, but they're at a different pace or a different speed. And then what happens? Then individual contributors tend to find out. So now we've got a major mismatch in communication. I've got, I've got a senior leader who's going to tell me about the bright new future. They're going to hand out popcorn, play rock jack music. There's going to be strobing lights. I've got a middle manager who's having an identity crisis. And I've got an employee who doesn't believe this is going to happen. How well do you think we communicate to each other in this space? And unfortunately, we would like to come at communication at this point from our perspective. The executive likes to say, the future is bright. The employee's sitting there going, I, I don't know what happened. And the leader is going, can I be successful here? Who, who can help who, right? So how we communicate, I, th I think, is really important in this space. Um, we can't communicate from our own perspective. I have to look at the audience I'm talking to and say, what perspective do I need to be communicating from their perspective? Where are they at in this story? So, Emmy, I'm going to add a, just a, a personal story here to show that we, while we talk about this stuff, we all went through this. Our team, yeah. who was supposed to be responsible for helping manage change in the organization, had to go through this first before we were able to be the cheerleader for the organization. Yeah. And a week after the announcement happened that we were going to be purchased by another company, you have these flood of emotions going through your head. All of a sudden, you don't want to make major purchases in your, in your family because you don't know if you're going to have a job, right? I mean, it's all sorts of crazy stories you're telling yourself. Even though I know they're crazy stories. It didn't matter because it's not rational at that point in time. And a week into this, I was in, in, the, in uh, my boss's office talking to him. He's a, he's a vice president. And he was going on about how this is the best thing since sliced bread, you know, the things that are going to happen because we're part of this company and all this. And I looked at him and I'm like, Paul? you're really just getting on my nerves right now. You need to stop being a cheerleader because I'm not ready to cheer yet. I'm not on your team yet. I don't know what this looks like for me, for you, for my people, and I'm not there yet. And if you walk out in front of our organization and you talk this way, you're gonna turn everybody away. You need to show some empathy. You need to acknowledge that they're scared and that they're feeling like they don't they don't know what their future is. You need to be that person. Yeah. I said, there's going to be time for us to cheerlead later. But right now, you're just, you're really getting on my nerves, right? I mean, come on. You need to just stop and think about how other people are, think, are, are feeling about right. this. So because he's the great person he is and I've known him forever, he's like, you know what? That's a great point. I hadn't thought about that before. But they go through the change so much faster. Usually, the high, I feel like the higher up in the organization they are, the faster they are. Because they almost feel as if they have no choice. Right? This is what it is. We're going forward. I don't get emotional about it. I don't worry about it. I just move forward. But not everybody can do that. Right. Right? So this is such a key uh, thing to remember and has changed the way we think about communication and about even the way we talk to people. And I think the way our leadership talks to people about yeah. things when they start to see this. And we have another saying we're in aerospace and maybe it just relates to us because of this. But, you know, when you're <laughs> in the airplane and the flight attendant says, you know, if the oxygen mask deploys, put it on you first and then help others. Um, it's kind of how we think about this as well, change management. As leaders, you have to take care of yourself first. You have to understand what stories you're telling yourself. You have to understand what emotional state you're in first if you're gonna go out and help your people get through it, right? So in that case, even Paul, it might have been helpful if he would have reoriented to, wait, here's where I'm at. These are the stories I'm telling. I'm way further out ahead than other people. I need to put my oxygen mask on first and, and help people where they're at, right? And, and come along in that journey. So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. 
Um, I'm not going to dwell on this one too long, but um, I think this is a helpful slide because sometimes we are in situations where we're having Office 365 that's coming our way. Uh, those decisions were being made by senior leaders. There were things they could and couldn't say. They just let us know that probably a couple months ago. And so very often in mergers and acquisitions, there's things that can't be said legally. There's just, they can't. So there are things though that you can say and not communicating isn't really a good solution. Um, I will call out the bottom one, which is don't walk in and say, trust me, because that's an earned situation. Um, but you can say things like, hey, we don't have the answer for that today. As soon as we know, we're going to let you know. Be as transparent as you can be. There are things you can say. Um, so this is the four that I had left off here. Um, and there is hope, right? <laughs> there is a, an ending to this that hopefully is um, good. And that is where we're kind of getting. I think right now we see ourselves very much in the messy middle. We're, we're in a lot of our KM tools and programs. We're trying to sort through a lot of things still. Um, I would say we're at the, we're starting to see the light at the beginning of the tunnel of four. Not the end of the tunnel, but the beginning of the tunnel. That's kind of where we're at in this space. Um, I, I would offer to help your people get, if you're a leader, make decisions as quickly as you possibly can, as prudently as you can, because the longer people are waiting for decisions to be made, the longer you're leaving them in anxiety. They can't make decisions. They can't take action. Action breaks that anxiety. So the faster you can make decisions will help them get on to, to level four and move through that change as quickly as possible. Um, Linda's going to tell you a little bit more about that, that bright future that we see on that um, solutions, searching for solutions kind of phase. So yeah. thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so the new normal, um, what is that? And I, I liked this picture when I saw it, first because it, every, I think everybody likes Toy Story, but um, Buzz's face is, check it out, look what we have in the future. Woody's face is, oh my gosh, what is that, right? <laughs> and so this is where KM, to me, really, we start to really meet the, the people in the messy middle because um, after we got through our kind of stress and anxiety about where are we going to be in the organization, is our stuff still going to be valid, is anyone going to listen to us, we have these great programs, how do we make sure people know about them? And um, I know that, that my boss did a lot of calming me down too, and he said, things aren't changing overnight. And even though they don't know about it today, you're going to keep doing what you do best, and eventually they will see the value, right? Eventually, they will see the value. This has been valuable to our organization for 20 years. Everything may not be exactly as it was, but it's a time for us to look at things and reevaluate and all that. And so between that, some of the pep talks, and between understanding that I know that knowledge management can be a first responder in moments of crisis and acquisition and merger and just change in general, um, trying to get the team kind of reset as to what is going to be our structure going forward, how are we going to help the organization, and what things can we do that will make sense to this new organization that owns us as well. In some cases, we speak different languages. We have, even though we're both in aerospace, we still have different acronyms and different processes and things like that, right? So we wanted to try to meet people where they were and, and try to look at our existing KM programs and solutions but also, it's been an amazing opportunity now that I look back and say, we wouldn't be doing some of the things we're doing today if it weren't for the acquisition. So I think we allowed ourselves to be complacent and we didn't even know we were, right? So the lesson here is don't wait for something, it's a crisis to go look at your program and your solutions and look at how things need to evolve over time and, and um, think about audiences differently that are coming into the workforce. You need to do it on a regular basis. You need to have those health checks on a regular basis. So it's been a really good lesson. And um, the need for knowledge management is, is, is always there in my mind. Uh, I'm an evangelist, right? I, I love this stuff. But I threw a couple of pieces of research in here that I pulled from APQC's um, knowledge base because I use them all the time. But one of the things in here is what, what's driving the need for, for KM on a regular basis? Change. What companies are saying is change, change coming at us all the time. We need to ensure that when technology changes, when the globalization of the workforce, with changing career expectations, we've got knowledge solutions in place to get that knowledge transferred faster, more efficiently, in the flow of people's work that they do every single day, not something they have to go look for, but something they can grab as they're performing their process, as they're doing their job, so that it's the most efficient that it can possibly be. The other piece on here that I threw in here 
is really that we talk about three knowledge gaps. We do a lot of talking about generational uh, differences and gaps and things like that. And while I think that's relevant, and, and I think about it too, I also think, uh, you know, I'm in, I'm in the, the, the Generation X category, but I work very differently than maybe other people in Generation X because I have been exposed to technology where I work, right? So am I so different from a millennial when I use my phone for everything and I'm constantly on technology? I don't know. So I try to look and, like I said, find people where they are in that moment, and we need to help people get through from a, um, from a uh, novice perspective, early career people, we also think about retirees a lot. I hear that on a regular basis. Oh my gosh, so-and-so is retiring. How do we get everything they know on paper in the next 30 days before they leave the company? Well, it's too late, first of all. It's too late. So we need to think about knowledge transfer through an employee's life cycle. So the things that we try to put in place at our company, we try to make sure that they are embedded in everyone's day-to-day -day work. Not just retirees, not just early career talent, everyone. Everyone can contribute. Everyone needs to be a part of it. And I love that middle section that, that uh, research is now calling that expert group. That's your next level experts. Who are those people who are stuck in the middle of their career and they're not considered quite the expert yet so nobody's uh, grappling for their, um, their knowledge, but they are amazing teachers, amazing mentors, um, and are gonna be your next level ex experts. So let's get them ready um, to go and be that next level expert before they reach that age of I'm within five years of retirement, right? And, and use these three groups of people together to go solve all of those knowledge gaps. So just a couple of, of, of quick research to, to, to say why knowledge management is always important and it continues to be important in our company as well. And we use these philosophies as we think about um, how we structure our team. So my, my organization is structured to address these four, um, I'll say pillars, as it relates to managing knowledge. So we, we take maybe a different approach than others. We don't own any tools. We don't drive uh, the, the, the purchase of any tools. But we are a big contributor in how tools are used across the organization. So we focus our solutions from a knowledge management perspective on the, um, the knowledge capture and transfer and dissemination and the curation of the actual knowledge and helping organizations to identify the critical and most relevant knowledge that they need to be concerned about. Not everything. Not everything needs to be captured and shared today. What is the most relevant knowledge that will support the business objectives that are right in front of you? If you keep it relevant, it feels a little less overwhelming, is how I'll say that. So we focus a lot in the knowledge space. And the reason we do that is if you look, we have a learning pillar as well. So we have folks in our team who actually develop real uh, training curriculum, and multimedia solutions for training, um, and, and some delivery of training. But we also offer um, instruction to our technical leaders so that they can become better teachers themselves. Because by nature, technical, our technical subject matter experts are not always the best teachers, and, so, and they want to get better, so we help them with those skill sets. We also have a pillar for change management. Emmy is my change lead, and we embed cha formal change management into our most critical um, improvement initiatives across our organization. I wish we could do it on every single thing, but sometimes the resources just aren't there. So part of what we do in every aspect of my team is we are in service to our organization. Whether we're providing the service ourselves to them, if we cannot do that to support an actual project, we have the, the, the model of creating playbooks so that people can become more self-sufficient in how they do work. And we teach them and we consult with them so that they can become their own advocates and do some of these things themselves. And in the innovation pillar, um, I have a little eye in there, you might not be able to tell, but um, I learned this from another company and I really liked how they approached uh, innovation with the little eye. Um, we have an amazing amount of innovation that happens at our company from a product perspective. To me, that's the big eye. They're developing the newest solutions that go on airplanes that make them safer, uh, fly faster, give us more data, make them more automated, all of those things, right? But the little eye to me is how you're managing within your organization, how you roll out your initiatives, how you um, put in place new processes, new tools, and things that are gonna change how people do work every day. It's really important that we include all of these aspects when we're rolling out our major initiatives because without change management, we will have resistance. We will have misunderstanding of what's happening. Without good knowledge solutions, that change will not be sustained. 
To me, knowledge management is the key to sustaining the major changes that you're incorporating in your, in your organization. If you don't have some of these knowledge solutions in place, the next group of people coming in to, to um, uh, work that new process, you roll it out, you give them everybody training once, and then you just let it go. Right? There's no big rollout of training that continues, usually for some big change. You have to have things in place to keep that knowledge flowing and growing and evolving in the organization so that it becomes part of the culture and how they do work every day. So this is, this is, um, these are the resources that, that I have within my team. This is how we structure it. And in all honesty, this has been, this has morphed over time this last year based on the needs of the organization. So we started out with an idea of what we needed to do. Uh, we had a little different team after the acquisition than what we started with, and so we've kind of morphed it, hired a couple of new people to really be able to meet the needs of the organization. The one benefit that we had is that our new organization who purchased us, UTC, has a really great measurement system in place. Um, they don't do KM necessarily, but they do have a way of measuring the proficiencies of their technical workforce. We did not have that in place at our company. To me, that was extremely valuable because now I have a great measurement system for all of these solutions that we're putting in place. So each time we roll out a new major change initiative, we um, put new training in place, we are contributing to the advancement of the proficiency of all of our technical disciplines. And I already have a measurement system that I can use to show that we're gonna continue to move that needle to the right. So it was a great partnership of two really good things that were happening at both of these companies, and now we both see the value of each of them. So it was a good way to merge together. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit, before I go to the next slide, so one of the other things that happened was, while I didn't have formal KM at the, co the company that purchased us, I found that I've met pockets of people who care about this stuff. They've been doing it themselves in silos. They've been reading about it. Um, they might have a learning team that maybe focuses just on formal learning, but they don't know a lot about knowledge management or change. And so over time, over the last few months, I've spent a lot of time just connecting with people, trying to figure out, how does this company run? Who are the people? What do they stand for? What are their areas of passion? What are their belief systems? All of these things. And over time, we've met some amazing people who have really challenged us to think differently, taught us new things. And I finally said, one of our mantras also in our team is to proceed until apprehend. If, you, if no one's telling you not to do it, why would I go ask permission? If I think it's the right thing to do and it's gonna help us be more effective, proceed until apprehended, and it works. And I don't mean do things illegally or unethically, that's not what I'm talking about. I follow standard processes. Ask Emmy, I won't cross the, the street without the walk sign popping up for me, right? I mean, I'm all about following the rules. But this is about connecting people and doing what I call the hard stuff at work, and that is sharing information, learning who the other experts are across um, in another state or in another, uh, another location or what have you. So we just said, all these people are trying to do great things and we're doing a lot of the same stuff and this is gonna be really hard if there's 100 of us doing it around the company and we're gonna have 100 different solutions. So we said, would everybody be willing to get together? We'll plan it. So we had an event, our first ever knowledge summit at our company um, three weeks ago, three, four weeks ago, in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I know, everybody wanted to come. It's the vacation spot of you know central central part of the country. But we had people coming from, we had about seven or eight different states represented. We had people from other divisions of our organization. And we all got together, there was about 85 of us, and we got together and we said, we all care about this stuff, but what are we doing? So we had multiple presentations, short presentations from people to talk about their current solutions. We did Knowledge Cafe to capture where are the areas we believe we need to work on as a company. We shared um, best practices. Somebody else had a great knowledge transfer toolkit that we had never quite had one put together at our company, so now we're all using it, and it's from Pratt & Whitney. And I'm like, this is amazing. This just saved my team three months of work, right? So what that did was it brought us together, it got everybody excited, in all honesty, we didn't know. We thought people might just sit and stare at us when we held this event. We didn't know what was gonna happen. It was amazing. The connections that were made and the excitement in the room because we focused on not our heritage businesses, but we focused on current capabilities and future possibilities together. And thus was our first knowledge management community of practice. So we are going to operate as a community of practice for knowledge workers, knowledge managers across the corporation. And we have five people that have um, uh, volunteered to be the leads 
of CROSS, we're all located in different places, and we're gonna continue to keep the conversation going and share these best practices with one another so that we're not working so hard that we can get to the point where we need to be in service to the people in our organization by providing them solutions, not spending so much time trying to develop solutions within knowledge management, if that makes sense. So um, with that, we talked about a new concept from a community perspective. So I mentioned communities of practice earlier, and our company had um, uh, been mostly in person and really that tacit conversation that was happening, but we need to be better at some of the capture processes within um, our communities. So what we did was we said, really what we need to do is we need to be the model for what we want these new communities to be because the, co the company is so big now that we need to bring people together in small pockets so that we can actually get work done because if we try to do something for the whole corporation, it's just not gonna work. There's 70,000 people, there's too many people. But if we can bring a group of 200 people who all work in the same domain or discipline area, they can do a lot for the company and they can learn from each other. So we've established this model where we've taken all the pieces basically of, of KM and said we want a community to be responsible for these things, utilizing the same tools, utilizing the same templates that we can all use and go be that success for that community of uh, that discipline, that domain area, that area of expertise within the company. And our community leaders gather on a regular basis and we'll talk about best practices and things like that as well, but we're trying to take communities to the next level. And with our new company that purchased us, they didn't have communities, so they don't know any different. So we're rolling something out for the first time and we're gonna say this is how we wanna do communities within our organization and this is how we're gonna model this to you. So it, it's a great time to evolve the program we had into something better and to introduce something new to an organization who didn't have it in the first place. And they're bringing all sorts of great ideas and um, we're gonna roll this out within our operations division as well as our KM community and then hopefully start to see it spread in all of our other areas. We have around 90-ish communities of practice in our company today. So could grow, could reduce, depending on what the need is, but that's about our current. Um, so just to give you an idea of my team, I talked about my team, but I just wanna let you know if you're thinking about what kind of people do you have on your team, we have a, uh, I know these aren't our real pictures, but um, we have very creative people in my team, so they created this for us, and we thought it was kind of fun to see our own little caricature, right, of ourselves. So we have a lead, we have a project management lead, we have some project managers, we have change managers, we have multimedia specialists, we have learning, and sometimes these um, skills can morph and change um, depending on the needs of the organization. If somebody leaves the team, we might hire something different the next time, but it's always to meet what are, what are the business objectives today and what are being required of us today to keep this knowledge management, um, uh, uh, these knowledge management solutions and programs going. And we always like to have an intern because they bring great new concepts to the team. So we do have an intern right now as well. And then just to close out, I know we're just about at time here, but the, um, this, this is something that resonates with the people in our company and I don't know if it will with you, but we have a lot of engineers so they really like formulas. And so they liked this because when we talked, we were trying to talk to them about change and why it was so important to have all of the aspects of change um, managed when you're doing a major initiative in the company because if you can see where those black spots are, if you're missing incentives, what do you end up with? You end up with more resistance, right? If you don't have a vision, People are confused, why are we doing this? I don't get it, this doesn't mean anything to me. This has no uh, purpose, I don't understand this. So if you're thinking about anything going forward, when your KM programs, you need to have all of these things in place for people to truly understand what's happening, whether it's rolling out a new tool, whether it's putting a new process in place, um, starting a community of practice, whatever that is. Think about change always in that complex fashion that these are all the things that people need in order for it to be successful. Okay, so just a nice little takeaway. And then just to close, I just said keep calm and love all history because um, there's been a, a point over the last few months and we're, like I said, we're starting to see the light at the beginning of our, our tunnel. But there was a long time where it was, well, we don't do it that way at UTC. Well, we don't do it that way at Rockwell Collins. And finally I was like, you know what? Rockwell Collins doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. We're Collins Aerospace, and that's all of us together, right? So we have to love everything that we've all done in the past to be successful, and this is a perfect opportunity for us to take all the goodness we had, and we have this new place to go do only the things we did well and take them forward and make them even better, 
and leave the negative behind, right? And just move forward. So um, I think I went right up to time. So my apologies, um, but thank you. Thank you for your time.